So I was invited to come to the nation's capital today to speak to a group of leaders about an issue that I think is of importance to all of us, and that is the economic environment that confronts us over the next 10 years. This is going to take everyone's engagement. It's going to be collective engagement and collective sacrifice. I am an optimist. I think the American people are up for it. And the real question is, do we have the leadership that has the will to lead us there? That is the real question. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I, I do uh, want to share some time with you talking about something that I think is, is just genuinely important. I, I think it really, it really matters. And what I'd like to do is to spend a few minutes with you telling you why it matters and then why me. So first, I couldn't have imagined that I would be on this stage. Uh, if I'd thought about it two years ago, I would, I would not have raised my hand. We were running a company. We were in the early stages of the financial crisis. Uh, it was all hands on deck, lots of things to do. Uh, and the fact is, uh, one of my directors said to me, look, you need to understand right now a standing nail gets whacked. And, uh, and I thought about that. And at least initially, I thought he was right and put my head down and went to work. But over these last couple of years, given the situation and the crises that we faced, out of this has come, I think, some, some serious issues that need serious conversation. We all understand that there is a level of unease in the American population about the economy. We all get it. We see it in polls such as, are your children going to do better than you do? Are you doing as well as you thought you would? Are we on the right track? some pretty basic fundamental core questions about who we are as a people and what we're doing. And the answer has been widely negative, and you all can find that, that data and, and look at it yourself. And I really began to try and understand what was it that was going on that was causing that level of unease. We all understand what 9.5% unemployment means. We understand when financial institutions go into disarray. But it struck me that this was deeper than that. It struck me that we were, people were beginning to identify a concern about where America was headed, just fundamentally and to its core. Now, uh, at Travelers, we are nothing if not data-driven. That has really been our hallmark and I think one of the great strengths of the organization. And notwithstanding the fact that I actually am a, a uh, an avowed news junkie. I'm actually someone who can sit down with C-SPAN for a warm evening and get cozy to it because I'm interested in listening to other people. I'm interested in listening to what public policymakers and thought leaders have to say. And yet, notwithstanding a 24-hour news cycle and a constant flow of information and data, I actually couldn't find any information about what really the long-term long prospects for our nation were. And so we decided at the company to do a deep dive ourselves. And, and, and it has been, candidly, it has been really remarkably revealing. I have shared this analysis with audiences both not so sophisticated as well as sophisticated, financially sophisticated. And frankly, the level of surprise at how the data sorts out and what it means about our future has, has candidly even surprised me. So it's been revealing, and I, I do think that uh, it's important we, we, to, to share with you and to engage as many people as we can in understanding the dynamics. Hopefully, we've presented this in a way that mere mortals can understand it. I've tried to stay away. I'm not, and notwithstanding a degree, a Bachelor of Science in Economics, I'm not an economist, and I don't pretend to be one. So I've tried to present the data in a way that regular kicking around business people would understand. If you were a CEO in a big company or in a small company and you asked your folks to go out and do a budget and do a plan and look, for the, look at the prospects over the next 10 years, what would they see, what would they analyze, and what would they share with you, and how could you understand it and react to it? And that's what we've done. We've used Congressional Budget Office data. And we used it, one, because it is bipartisan. Two, it's statute driven. It's comprehensive, it's thoughtful. My hat is off to those people. It's presented in a transparent way. It allows analysis to be done thoroughly and completely. It's really an exceptional asset that we have. It doesn't mean, though, that one can't have a different view and take a different uh, position with respect to some of the projections. But the work is just very first-rate, high-quality high quality work. And, and most importantly, 
It's the data, frankly, that our public policymakers use to make decisions, form policy, engage in public debate. So it's impossible, I think, to do a thoughtful analysis and not tackle it and not really come, not really come to understand it. So, so that's the why. And, and the why now really gets to the title of this presentation. As, as you'll see, this is not a next decade issue. This is here and now, today, right here. Time is not our ally. The longer we wait, the more painful the resolution will be. The longer we wait, the more painful the resolution will be. I am convinced after looking at this data, if the question gets asked whose ox is going to be gored, the answer is everyone's. Because the problem is so comprehensive and so large that it's impossible for small groups to solve this problem. So it's going to affect, I think, 300 million Americans and time really is of the essence. And now, why me? And with, um, at the risk of starting with a speech that had all started at a 10,000 watt radio station in Houston, Texas, um, I want to share with you a picture. Uh, it's 19, I do get emotional on this one. This is 1947. And the, um, the green circles are my mother and father. The uh, red circles are my mother's father and mother. The blue circles are my great-grandparents. Uh, and the uh, little baby down there in the purple circle is actually my now 63-year-old sister. And um, here's, the, here's my family story. It really is standing around this table. My maternal grandmother, the woman in the red circle, gets sent over here. Now, this is family lore, but I've done the best I can to verify this, and I actually believe it's so. My grandmother gets sent over here by herself from Eastern Europe to go live with distant relatives when she's 13 years old, put in a boat and sent over here in the early 1900s. And she was sent over because she could sew, and she could get a job, which she did on the Lower East Side, and she became a seamstress, and slowly, one at a time, sent enough money back so that her four brothers and sisters and her parents could eventually emigrate to the United States and, and that's how we came to be here. My father, two years here out of service, um, was desperately trying to start a small printing business and ultimately would prove successful at it, but I'm the son of a small businessman and I'm really talking about a small business, enough so that he could pay the rent, quite literally the rent, and he could educate his kids. So my sister and I are the first generation to go to college in, in our family and the poignancy of this particular picture is that these four generations lived in a two-bedroom apartment in the Bronx together. All four generations in one two-bedroom apartment in the Bronx. Now, I was born in the Bronx, spent my early years there when we, when we went uptown to White Plains. That was quite the uptown move. But the dynamic of going from this picture in, I think, what is a generational blink of an eye for me to be standing here on this stage in front of all of you and having the privilege of running a Dow 30 company is remarkable to me. It's honest to God, it's just remarkable to me. And that is the American opportunity. I have been very directly the beneficiary of that opportunity. I can do it. Of that opportunity of coming to the US, working hard, and making something of yourself. And so I just feel a personal obligation to be engaged. That, that's what I feel. I feel a personal obligation to be engaged because I'm worried that that opportunity is at risk. And shame on me, given the wonderful benefits that I've had in my life, if I don't stand up for it. So I'm here to make this presentation, and I want to make three points before, as, as Warner Wolf would say, we go to the videotape. The first is, there's nothing political in this speech. If you hear anything political, you're not listening carefully. I have no, I have no, this is a human speech, it's an economic one, it's a personal one in some measure, but it sure isn't political. Two, there's no, I'm not advocating for any single policy or policies. You won't, you won't hear that. I don't have solutions. I'm quite convinced there are solutions. I'm quite, I am an optimist. I'm quite convinced that there are actually a number of different solutions. What I'm not so convinced of is if we have the will to live up to them, as if we have the will to stand behind them and make them happen. I'm not so convinced of that, so what I am advocating for is leadership. 
Now, lots of you were inside the Beltway folks, and you may chuckle at what I'm about to say, but I believe that it takes leadership beyond, that's, that transcends politics, and maybe the hardest thing of all, that transcends election cycles. I am also convinced that this challenge is of sufficient depth that if we think of things in two or three or even four year cycles and don't remain committed to a solution, we got a real problem. We got a real problem. And, and I hope in the context of putting this data together and doing it in a way that again, mere mortals can understand it. By the way, I'm one of those mere mortals. I just, I just haven't been able to fully get the way people speak about the economic environment in which, in which we're living today and where we're headed. So let me turn to the analysis and, and, and share a few things with you. So the first is, Obvious question, where are we headed and why, why does it matter? So let me, let me put up kind of the bottom line to start with. This is Congressional Budget Office data for 2020. This is where they think we're going to end up. So revenues, and I'm gonna take you through where we are today so you'll understand what's embedded in these assumptions, and that is a critical part of this analysis, by the way, the assumptions and are they realistic. $4.8 billion, we're going to have a little over $5.5 billion of expenses, a nearly $700 billion deficit in that year. Federal debt will have grown to an excess of $16 trillion. That's $16 trillion. Debt as a percentage of GDP will be up at almost 70%. And I just find it interesting, no one else does, to look at debt as a percentage of revenues, because that's typically how I always thought of my own economic situation. How much do I owe? How much do I make? It just it sort of made sense to me. And so here, debt is a percentage of revenues a little over, over three times. Now, what you're gonna hear from me is notwithstanding how challenging this picture is, is it reasonable to assume that it can actually be this good? Is it reasonable to assume it can actually be this good? Let me give you a couple of the underlying dynamics. There is a large deficit in each and every year that the CBO projects between now and 2020. And the cumulative amount of those deficits over these 10 years is $6.2 trillion. $6.2 trillion over the next 10 years. So as we start thinking about policy and solutions, you got to understand the magnitude of the challenge we're facing. You know, rule number one typically, when in a hole, stop digging. And, and, this, is, and this, is where, this is where we're headed. So the, the, the takeaway here is, Getting to 2020 is going to be difficult and painful, and frankly, when you look underneath, is it reasonable to assume that it could be this good? Let me go back 10 years and set the, and set the framework for you. So this is the federal budget back in the year 2000, a mere 10 years ago, and the numbers themselves are not all that critically important, but it is useful to just get a grounding. So we've got revenues of two trillion, $2 trillion, we've got spending of a trillion eight, we've got a surplus of $200 million in the year. Federal debt is a mere $3.4 trillion at that point. And if you think about this as a balance sheet, as the balance sheet of a business, you'd look at it and you would say, pretty good, pretty good. Income statement, balance sheet. Now, fact is, is that the dynamics that surround some of the challenges we face, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and some of the other dynamics, were already there, already apparent, and were already visible to some folks and they were starting to talk about it. The question was, did anybody have the will to actually sit down and begin to do anything about it? But I found the distinction here between discretionary and mandatory, which is something that gets chatted about endlessly in the public arena, fascinating. Because in the end, I found it difficult to sort out. I understand the dynamic, that which is considered mandatory is either mandatory by contract, think paying interest on debt, or mandatory by statute. Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, food stamps, supplemental income. But now, take a look at the, discre the so-called discretionary side. First, we've got defense, which of course stands on its own. And then, interesting to me, you've got things like national parks, foreign aid, the federal justice system, homeland security, health-related research. That's considered discretionary. It strikes me, anyway, just as one person, that a lot of those things define the fabric of who we are as a people the things that we value, the things that we think are important, the out global outreach, protecting our own, taking care of those who need help, our national parks. Can you imagine closing the Grand Canyon? Of course you can. So I took a step away and I thought, all right, I'm gonna do away with these artificial distinctions between discretionary and mandatory because I just don't think they're all that substantive. There's a human dynamic that's different, but there's not a substantive policy difference. 
So I started thinking about this as, okay, we got $2 trillion in revenues, how do we want to spend it? How do we as a people, 300 million people, decide we want to spend $2 trillion in revenues? And it gets real interesting when you break it down to that level of simplicity and you start thinking about how much do we bring in and how much are we going to spend? So now let me, let me turn the clock forward to 2010. This is where we are right now. Revenues flat. This, is, this by the way, is all federal revenues. That's what we're dealing with here, all federal revenues. Now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about state municipal for like a second and a half down the road, but that's what I'm focusing on right now. Revenue stayed flat over this period of time, two trillion, two trillion, spending almost doubled from a trillion seven to three trillion five. So of course, what was a surplus has become a deficit of a trillion three hundred million dollars, billion dollars. And now that's the annual stuff. That's the P and L for the business people. Now let's take a look at the balance sheet. Well, our debt's grown from three trillion four to nine trillion dollars in those ten year period of time. Ten years, two point six times what it was ten years ago. Debt as a percentage of GDP went from 35% to 62, and debt as a percentage of revenues, which again kind of resonates with me, went from 170 to 420. That's a real change in 10 years. That's a real change. And so if this were our business, if this were our company, alarm bells would be going off internally. How did we get here, and where do we go? So now let's, let, me, let, me, let me again take a look underneath this. And, and here's, here's a, a fascinating, I'm gonna again ignore the typical discussion of what's mandatory and what's discretionary. I wanna leave you with a point on this, a little factoid. It's like from um, Willie Geist, too early with Willie Geist, if you wanna sound smart. Federal debt has gone from three trillion four to nine trillion dollars in that period of time, and yet net interest payments have gone down from 223 billion dollars to 202. Obvious, the federal government is, is the beneficiary of the remarkably low interest rates that we're all dealing with today. Whether you're a borrower or a lender, it actually doesn't matter. The effective interest rate back in 2000 was 6.5%. It's 2.2 in 2010. If the interest cost were the same, and we can have a really rich debate one day about what's driving that, the incremental interest cost this year would be almost $600 billion. If the government financed its obligation in 2010 the same way it did in 2000, $600 billion more. So you can now play with the, with the pie on the right. Does that mean that the total deficit would have been almost $2 trillion? Or does it mean that we would have attempted to change spending in some other way? I'd, I'd point out from the graph that the $600 billion that I'm identifying is like about equal to all other discretionary spending and a good hunk of the, or a good hunk of the defense. So we, we're fortunate here. We have, a, we have a moment in time where notwithstanding how challenging things are and how difficult this analysis looks, we're actually a beneficiary. Now if that changes and it changes suddenly, and you've got lots of economists who actually think that it will at some point, staying away from advocacy, then you can come to a different conclusion about, about 2010. But it's a fascinating analysis to simply look at how much money are we bringing in and where's it going. So now let me turn the clock ahead to, to, to 2020. Again, same data I showed you before. Federal debt now going from $9 trillion to $16 trillion in that period of time. So that's the $6.2 trillion of cumulative annual deficits that keep getting financed by borrowing. Debt as a percentage of GDP goes up to 69%. Debt as a percentage of revenues actually goes down, driven in large measure by the fact that there's an assumption that revenues are going to more than double over this period of time. That's a big deal. I'm gonna go into that for a little bit, but there's a presumption in here that revenues are going to more than double in the next, in the next 10 years. And so I, I look at that, and I look at that 10 year period, and I go, wow. Now, what's, what's really troubling about 2020 is not so much. It's bad enough the point in time data. It's bad enough. But it's the direction of things that really is deeply troubling. This is a simple graph of the projected deficit in each year between now and 2020. And obviously coming out of the stimulus spending and the bailout costs, we make some real improvement coming into 2015, and then the Congressional Budget Office data actually has it heading in the wrong direction from that point on. Now, 
if this is real simple, if it's red, we're still running negative. We'd like it to be less red, we'd like it to be blue. But you're dealing with a circumstance here where the trend heading into a, a, a point in time is troubling because it's not on a path to getting better. And when I share with you the assumptions that are embedded in this, I bet all the change in my pocket that you're all going to be pretty surprised as to what are the assumptions that are embedded in this and the fact that revenues are, are more than doubling and yet the deficit continues to do what it, what it does. One more little factoid, and this really, made it, this really made it for me. The total revenues in 2010, $2,100,000,000,000, will not be enough to fund Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare 10 years from now. If we simply take the demographics and we age people and we know exactly what it's going to look like, as an insurance company, I actually do believe that we do know what it's going to look like. Two, no, almost $2.7 trillion in 2020 for Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. Total revenues today, $2.1 trillion. You begin to get a sense of the magnitude of the problem and the challenge that lies ahead of us and the fact that any solution here has to, by definition, affect lots and lots of people. I want to make one other point about the next 10 years, and I, and I say this as a, as a business person who actually has the good fortune of running a company that's been in pretty good shape. We're already, we've never, we, we all, it is already such that we've never been here before. Business people, markets, international finance, we've never anticipated a 10-year period that looks like that. And so when someone says, how are the markets going to react to this, or how will businesses react to this? The truth is there's more uncertainty about it now than ever before. And for all of the conversation about the uncertainty that business people face, as I've sat and spoken with other CEOs, I am convinced that when they say the world is so uncertain, I don't, I'm not ready to make the commitment, they're not talking about whether unemployment's gonna be 9.5 or 9.0, or whether the tax rates are or aren't going to change. They're talking about this. They're talking about what the next 10 years are going to look like and what does it do to each of our propensity to save and invest and spend and educate and what happens to the economic engine that we all engage in and as business people, what does that mean for our investment? And until I think there is some clarity with respect to these 10 years in a way that doesn't look red alert like, I suspect you will continue to hear that discussion that the level of, of uncertainty and indecision is high. Because it is. I don't know what this means for borrowing costs. I don't know what this means for liquidity. I don't know what this means for cost of doing business. I don't know what it means for price increases. I have no idea. We've never been here before. And that level of uncertainty is real, particularly when you put your head on the pillow at night as one guy responsible for a business with others, but you are the ultimate person sitting up there and saying, I, don't, I just don't know. I don't know. So we all get a little more conservative. We get a little cautious. We do more with less. We don't hire. We work the crowd a little longer because we just don't know what it means. This is real. This is a real problem. Okay, I want to take you through the assumptions, and I'm going to go through these somewhat rapidly because you're all sophisticated enough to get it and to get it quickly, and the question is, are these optimistic? Notwithstanding how problematic the next 10 years look like and that balance sheet looks like in 2020, how do we even get there? Well, here's some real data for you. This, again, comes right from the CBO. I, I, this, is just, this is what's embedded in those assumptions you saw. So one, there is an assumption that unemployment will be cut in half by 2015, will be down to 5.1%, round numbers half, from 10 to 5. Now, we're having a tough time making some real progress in that regard. You all know the numbers. We need to create between a million and a million two hundred thousand jobs a year in the U.S. just to keep up with changing, with changing population. And so you need a pretty healthy engine, an economic engine, to add real job growth if we're going to see this. This would imply a level of economic growth that would be Herculean. And again, I put it in the context of the level of uncertainty that's so apparent to all of us. This is a big deal relative to that assumption, because now we're going to get back to what does it mean for taxable income, what does it mean for personal savings, what does it mean for revenues, and by the way, what does it mean for spending? 
because it all rumbles through it. It rumbles through it in unemployment compensation, it rumbles through it in taxable income, in taxes paid. This is a big assumption. We're going to do all this, including getting to $16 trillion of indebtedness without triggering inflation. And again, I want you to understand, this is simply what's embedded in those, in those projections. So we've been, we're awfully nimble, and we end up coming out of this at a 2.3% long-term consumer price index assumption. Maybe, could be, hope so. Again, I'll tell you, we've never been here before. We've never seen the money supply do what it's done. We've never seen, an, again, not an advocacy position for or against. I'm just making a factual observation. We've never seen quantitative easing of the type that's now being discussed. I don't know. I don't know if this is possible or not. But I know that we would look back on this if we achieved it, and we would say, that was a job extraordinarily well done. This one's interesting to me. This is an assumption about what the 10-year Treasury will become. Will ultimately, I think it's 2.4% or so this morning. And uh, the assumption is, is that as we come out of this and, and we begin to generate some real economic growth, that interest rates will rise. But in the context of long-term rates, you would put a 5.9% 10-year Treasury at the low end of the spectrum, certainly not at the high end. And how we finance $16 trillion publicly and do so with a robust economic engine that's going to be needed to create the other statistics I spoke about is at least confusing to me. Again, I'm not an economist. I'm not an economist. But I see the inconsistency potentially in the assumptions. Maybe, we'll, maybe it's, it'll happen. I'm, I'm not saying it won't. Don't misunderstand my comments here. I'm just trying to share with you what's embedded in the numbers, and I'll let you come to your own conclusions about it. And here's the, here's the big kahuna. Here's nominal GDP growth. So we come out of this and ultimately get a robust recovery. By the time we get to 11 and 12, it's 3.3 and 4.1 percent. It peaks out at a little over 6, and then comes down to mid fours. In this analysis, it assumes no recession. It assumes no other financial crisis. It assumes actually no further repercussions from declining housing markets and what that does to people's savings and how they feel about spending. Now, you begin to understand how these, how these assumptions begin to link together. The only way that one can generate that kind of employment growth is to generate economic, uh, GDP growth of this magnitude. And, and of course, the thing begins to, to, come, to come together. But if you were a business person, you'd look at these assumptions and you'd say, all right, let's, let's do a downside case. I want to come back to that in a second because that is so important. So those are the economic factors. I want you to understand the statute factors that are embedded in this. This is CBO data. So again, $16 trillion of debt, $6.2 trillion of deficits over the next 10 years. First is there is an assumption in here already that all the tax cuts expire, all of them. So we're not talking about whether it's 200 or 250 or 500 or a million. The underlying assumption here is the tax revenue is benefited by the elimination of all the tax cuts. Second one is one that actually hasn't been spoken about very much, but it's here, it's here and now, which is the alternative minimum tax is not going to be indexed for inflation. For all the conversation about tax policy, this is going to have a real effect when people go to file their 2010 tax returns. The AMT is going to capture way more people, I think, than anyone anticipates that it will, because historically it has been indexed for inflation, so we haven't had to deal with this. But this is for real, and people may very well wake up to this and say, gee, I had no idea. But that's in here, and it's in here as incremental tax revenue. It actually assumes that there will be annual reductions to physicians for Medicare payments. We have not had the political will to do that before, but it does assume, because it's contained in the statute, that we will. And that's an interesting phenomena for those who have doctors in the family. And then lastly, it assumes that we actually get discipline. That discretionary spending, notwithstanding my willingness to kind of remove it from the discussion as, as being truly unimportant, I don't mean that the spending isn't important, but the distinction isn't meaningful. It's a, it's a distinction without a difference, I think, is the, is the expression. Is that we assume that that's only going to rise with inflation, which over the time period is about 1.8% overall, in spite of the fact that in the last 10 years we've been growing at 7.5% on average. So I take, a look, I take a look at all that, and I go, again, awfully optimistic assumptions. Now let me, let me tell you one that's bothering me because it's not embedded here. It's, 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 a quiet, it's a quiet problem, but it's real. We all understand the dynamic of the flattening world, particularly, 
particularly given the fact that 69% of all jobs in the private sector now are service-based. And whether you're a radiologist that now suddenly finds the films being read overnight in different countries around the world, we're beginning to wake up and understand that service-based economies have a Tom Friedman-like effect, have an ability to, to flatten things out. Now, one can speculate as to whether that will have an impact on personal income for those who compete on a global basis. There are certainly plenty of groups of employees you can think about in the last 24 months who have seen this firsthand and up close. But the real question to me about this is, Will U.S. personal income over the next 10 years, and obviously therefore tax revenue because people pay taxes on their personal income, will it rise as much as inspected given the fact that we're going to increasingly face a global border-free labor market? I don't know. But I know it's not in the numbers. That I know. I know it's not in the numbers. So kind of bottom line, my, my own take on it is that in my job, I would turn to the finance group, and, and our guys are the best. They really are. And I would say, our guys and women are the best, by the way. We have real women leaders. I didn't mean that in any, in any substantive way. I'd say, you know what? Go back and do a downside case. Give me a few things going wrong. Show me what happens if interest rates rise beyond what we expect. Show me what happens if inflation begins to ramp up. Show me what happens if we're unable to drive unemployment down to that level in that short period of time and show me what the, what the numbers look like. Because in the end, I personally think that good business leaders hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And I'm really not at all sure that we're even addressing what the worst can be. Our sense of unease is driven by data that when you simply take a step back, pull the assumptions back, you'd say, you know, it's, it's not batting a thousand, but it's pretty close. It's pretty close. I, I don't want to scorecard it, but if this actually happened and we ended up with those economic assumptions, we'd look back on these last 10 years, notwithstanding the fact that we would have $16 trillion in federal debt, and we'd say, that was a pretty good decade. So I'm worried about it. I'm worried about it a lot. I'm worried about it that things could actually be considerably worse than we think they could be. And because we've never been here before, it's hard to do the analysis. It's hard to simply crank it through and say, well, what happens if? But I think there's a responsibility for us to begin to engage in that, to demand, to demand that debate, to demand it. Two minutes on state and local government, because this has sat, that whole federal dynamic sits underneath an emerging issue at the state and local government level. This is simply state and local a debt outstanding, approaching two and a half trillion dollars. Uh, in 2010. Lots have been written about it and obviously problems in, in all sorts of states and issues related to it. What's a little less, people know this, but it's just not as visible, which is what are the unfunded liabilities that actually exist at the state level? This is real numbers. It's from the Pew, the Pew Center. So in the pension arena, the liabilities are largely funded. There's about $450 billion, this is billions, of unfunded pension liabilities, but OPEB is other post-employment benefits, principally medical. There are others, but it's principally medical. So you've got $555 billion of unfunded post-employment benefits. You put the two together, you got a trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities at the state and local level. On top of two and a half trillion dollars of debt, call it three and a half trillion, I'm gonna remind you that was the debt in the early slide that I put up of the federal debt in 2000. The state and local governments, if you add up debt and unfunded liabilities right now, equal the debt position of where the U.S. government was a mere 10 years ago. This sits on top of that, of that federal issue. So, as I say, I'm a, I'm a C-SPAN junkie. And, 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 and so now we're back to why and why, is it, why does it matter? And I think that, that, that Ken Conrad gave a, a terrific interview, particularly of the young people in the room. This is worth listening to. This is a public policymaker who at least is beginning to understand the issue and grasp its consequence. Young people should especially care because if this debt goes to the levels that are now anticipated, 
that would put a crushing burden on them. It would also weaken the economy at the very time they want to be financing their kids' education or buying a home or purchasing a car. Uh, so it would have a direct effect on the quality of their lives. It's encouraging when we actually hear voices that are trying to raise the alarm. Let me spend a few minutes at least on how we got here, although I'm sensing from the room that you're kind of getting it. But, but let me nonetheless take a, take a little bit of time on this. First, this is no great shock, we got older. Life expectancy up, the percentage of population at 65 years plus has gone up. We've got a older population being supported, a, a broader, a bigger number, bigger percentage of the population in that retirement benefit arena being supported by a smaller number of younger workers. And if you see, this problem will really begin to exacerbate itself again, it has before, but again as we get towards 2015. These statistics are just, they're just demographics, that's all they are. We got older and that's putting real stress obviously on Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, as well as the post-employment benefit liabilities that I spoke about at the state and government level. Two, medical inflation has been dramatic. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody in this room how much time has been spent on medical inflation, but it's a real number and we're spending a lot more and we're keeping, and we're dealing with, with diseases that we wouldn't have thought about 30 or 40 years ago. We're keeping people alive. These are all good things. These are all good things, but we're spending real money on it and the question becomes, how do we want to finance it? How do we want to finance it? Three, Medicare and Social Security. Medicare originated in 1965. Life expectancy was 70. It's now 78. And of course, we've expanded the benefits since the plan was originally introduced. Social Security originated in 35 when life expectancy was 62. Minimum access age was 65. Again, we've got a 78-year access uh, life expectancy now. We've lowered the access age to 62 on a discounted basis, although that whole dynamic is beginning to get some attention, and we're beginning to push that off. Now, whether that's, whether that's part and parcel of a solution or not, who knows, but this is not a problem that's, that's not, I think, well, well recognized. These next couple were interesting ones to me. This is the growth in both federal as well as state and local employees dating back to 1960. So this is, and the federal is exclusive of the military. Uh, federal has largely been flat over that period of time. State and local has been growing at two, almost 2.5% two a year on a compounded basis since 1960. That's 700 basis points more than the private sector. It's 1.7% approximately compound growth rate for the private sector, 2.4%. For the, for the state and local, exacerbated by getting older, the benefit structures and all the rest, we're creating an upside down pyramid that becomes increasingly difficult to, uh, to finance. And, I, and, and I, I go back for a moment on that and just an observation, nothing more than that, although you're going to, to hear a little about it. You've all read that in fact the, at least the analysis suggests that Wages, salaries, benefits in particular in the public sector, and I'm speaking now specifically to state and local governments, are actually now at levels that exceed equivalent private sector jobs. And so the private sector operating in a competitive environment, we've all gone through the process of thinking about how much employees contribute to their medical plans and what do they do with respect to defined benefit pensions, which are largely gone from the private sector, and 401ks and contributions. That's a phenomena that really hasn't occurred in the public sector. And so you've got an increasing growth rate of, of, of employees in that segment, in the public sector, that's actually being supported by a smaller number of growth of employees in the private sector that aren't earning as much or generating the benefits as much as the public sector is. And there's another ox and gore story, but I'll leave that for another day. I size it up and I really do think it is in the end all about leadership and choices. This is, this is not all that difficult to understand. This is, this is pretty easy, I think. And I, I just want to put this up. I don't know if Governor Christie is right. I don't mean about the facts. I'm sure he's right about the facts. His staff wouldn't let him speak if it wasn't. I don't know if his solutions are right or wrong, and I don't know whether I agree with him or not. But here's a guy who's telling it, I think, like he sees it. He's being transparent, he's being candid, he's, he's letting people know what the facts and circumstances are, and he's explaining his choices. 
And I think this is the starting point of leadership, transparency, openness, understanding, and sharing of the issue. One state retiree, 49 years old, paid over the course of his entire career a total of $124,000 towards his retirement pension and health benefits. What will we pay him? $3.3 million in pension payments over his life and nearly half a million dollars for health care benefits. A total of $3.8 million on a $124,000 investment. Is that fair? A retired teacher paid $62,000 towards her pension and nothing, yes, nothing, for full family medical, dental, and vision coverage over her entire career. What will we pay her? $1.4 million in pension benefits over her lifetime and another $215,000 in health care benefit premiums over her life. Is it fair? for all of us and our children to have to pay for that excess? The total unfunded pension and medical benefit costs are $90 billion. We would have to pay $7 billion per year just to make them current out of current revenues. We don't have that money. You know it and I know it. That's what's been done to our citizens. We need to offer a pension system that we can afford. And we can no longer offer health benefits that are 41% more expensive than the average Fortune 500 company's costs. That is truly the unfair part of this equation. That's an address to the legislature. And uh, he actually does periodically, he does interviews on CNBC, not a plug for CNBC, but a pretty powerful guy in a, in a casual setting. And just, I think, trying to tell it like, like it is. I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting, or at least like he sees it, at least as he sees it. I, I think it's interesting. I, you know, I, I grew up in the financial arena where a chairman of the Federal Reserve, their, their job was to be uh, quiet and do their thing behind closed doors and calm the markets. And, you know, I think that, that Chairman Bernanke is actually doing a remarkably good job in being visible and outspoken as a Fed leader should be given the circumstance we're facing. I just thought his quote, this is back in April, I, the quote is really very, very telling. That, and he's really speaking about it from the aging population dynamic, but unless we are willing to make difficult choices, uh, we, will, we will neither uh, have financial stability nor healthy economic growth. And, and, and again, reading, not to read too much between the lines on here, but for a Fed chairman to be this vocal is, is I think, awfully interesting. Um, so choices, this is, this is a fascinating analysis that's been done by an outside firm what this attempts to do is to quantify a series of mutually exclusive actions that would be taken, have, that could be taken, that would reduce the deficit to 3% of GDP in 2015. To do that would require either revenues or expenses or some combination thereof of $550 billion, 550. So if we wanted to cut discretionary spending by 40%, that would get us there. If we wanted to raise individual taxes by 30%, it would get us there. If we want to impose a VAT tax of 7.7% based upon expected consumption expenditures, it would get us there. And lastly, if we want to do it by raising all taxes by 8 and cut all spending by 7, that also gets us there. But it's $550 billion. We're not talking about nickels and dimes here. And, and of course, this brings home very poignantly that time is of the essence. The longer we wait, the more difficult this is going to get. And, and I also am, again, completely convinced that this is not a question of whose ox is going to get gored. It's, it's everyone. We're just so far over our skis, beyond our means, that it's impossible for small groups in some way to solve this problem. It's just that big. So you talk about $550 billion, and I want to share with you a, a wonderful speech, that, that, a short one, that Judd Gregg gave from the, from the floor of the Senate back in March. So the background is this. The Senate had just passed, and for those of you who are in, the, in government, forgive my ignorance about this. I may not express it quite correctly, but had passed this PAYGO dynamic, 
where the rule was that there'd be no spending unless it was offset in, in another program, unless it were deemed to be an emergency, in which case we'd put it aside and we would deal with the spending dynamic. And so it literally happened just, I guess, a couple of weeks before this. And the debate is over a, uh, an inner city summer jobs program. That, that's the debate, that's the, that's the item on the floor. And it's for $2 billion, for $2 billion. That's the, that's the price tag for the program. And, and this, is, this is Senator Gregg's speech with respect to what's going on on the floor. Senator from New Hampshire is recognized. Why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep passing on to our children these debts? Why do we keep running programs out here after programs that are shrouded in sweetness and light but aren't paid for? We just passed a pay-go point of order here four weeks ago. It's a great fanfare, great breast-beating about how fiscally responsible we were going to be. And time after time since we passed that pay-go point of order, amendments have been brought to this floor which violate it. And this is another one. This amendment costs $2 billion, which isn't paid for. Summer jobs may be good. I'm sure they are good. But why do you want to put the debt for those summer jobs onto the children of the people who are having the summer jobs? If this is a priority, and it is, let's pay for it. Let's take the money out of some other account. But let's not add to the debt, and let's not once again violate the PAYGO rules, which this Senate has so profoundly or loudly proclaimed are the, is the manner in which we're going to discipline ourselves fiscally. It's a $2 billion item. If you can't stand by PAYGO for $2 billion, you're making a farce. So the slide before, we talked about $550 billion and trying to find a resolution with respect to that. And, and here's a, an, an emotional moment on the floor with a, with a $2 billion program. It really, I think, speaks to the gap that we have, the gap between what is, I hope to many of you now, painfully obvious, I hope it is, and the will that we have to actually do the things that are necessary to make it right. I do think there are really good things happening. Now, whether in fact it turns out to really good action, we will see. We have two terrific bipartisan commissions that have been charged with figuring it out. Figure it out. Give us a plan. These are talented people. They care deeply. They're emotionally committed and involved. I've listened to a couple of them speak about what they're doing. I think this is real important, and we expect the report, what, by the end of this year is what the, is what the expectation is. This is really the first attempt that I'm aware of, of trying to recognize the, the, the severity of the issue and empowering talented, thoughtful people to engage and try and figure out where we go from here. So I've tried to stay away from either political positioning or particular issue advocacy. I've tried very hard to be an advocate for the American opportunity. And as I, as I tried to figure out how, to, how do you close, particularly with a sophisticated group like this, I tried to figure out if I could snap my fingers and make something happen, what would I do? And it seems to me that it would be a real plea for leadership. And I think there's a few things. And again, for those inside the Beltway, you may actually chuckle at this. But I think we need leadership now more than ever that not only transcends politics, that's kind of easy, but actually one that transcends election cycles. How can you possibly manage a problem of this magnitude if every two or four years the fundamental policies that we engage in are up for grabs? If you ran a business that way, you wouldn't be running it for long. These are issues that are going to take really serious time and attention and engagement, consistency, performance, measurement, watching, tracking, all of us together trying to make it better. It can't be ultimately subject to the election cycles. How we do it? I have no idea. But I know, I know it's obvious that that's what it's going to take. Two, we have remarkable economic expertise and resources here. I, I find it interesting, and maybe these commissions will be transparent about how they're doing it. Any other time we have faced a, a, a real serious issue nationally, we take the experts, we put them in a room, and we say, figure it out. And, and be vocal, be visible. Here, we somehow think that, that this kind of issue is the subject of, of the political debate. And, and, and folks who are not trained, knowledgeable about complex economic matters, we're in a different zone here. And the notion that, that we somehow don't turn to the remarkable 
strength, the expertise that exists in, in, in the United States and say, please, go, go help us figure it out is really a remarkable loss to me, an untapped resource, untapped expertise. It seems to me that whatever plan, and by the way, I'm, I'm actually of the mindset that there's lots of plans that will ultimately get us there. I don't think that there's one magic solution that we somehow have to force our way to. I think there's lots of solutions and everything should be on the table. But I do think that it's going to take broad-based collective sacrifice and that plan has to be articulated clearly so that everybody understands what we're all doing together, how we're all solving the issue, not leaving it to one small group or another group because it's just well beyond the economics for that to happen. And finally, to have the will to stick to it. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced you know, here in the United States we can do anything we want. I'm convinced we can do any two things, any hundred things. The only thing we can't do is everything. And that, unfortunately, is what we've been trying to do, everything, all at once. And that just doesn't work. It's taken us a while to get here. It's going to take a real commitment of leadership to get us out. I thank you very much for your time and attention today. I hope it's been worth being here. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. How do we make 100% of the people to work, go to work, produce two to three times what they were producing before, increase of productivity, greater amount of manufacturing of products and services. So who is doing that plan? And yeah, I'm darned if I know who's doing it. <laughs> I, 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 let, me make, let me make an observation, because I, again, you're talking, you're talking to uh, someone who just feels strongly about that American opportunity, just given my history. I don't think my father could start his printing business today. I think the regulatory and tax and cost environment is such that he actually couldn't get the darn thing started. I don't think he could. So we have the Travelers Institute. It's, a, it's an organization that Joan Woodward has led for us and has done a fabulous job raising, raising issues of serious public policy, public policy debate in a public way. We've tackled a couple of issues in the last year. I've asked Joan to tackle small business creation as the next issue. I, I don't, I, I struggle enormously. Now there's a tiny of a, bit of a sub rose agenda. We're one of the largest insurers of small businesses in the United States. But when you actually look and you go into specific towns, you get into specific situations, and you look at the barriers that exist to creating a newly created small business, it's, it's remarkable. And, and uh, you know, there's a whole debate to be had about how do we lower the barriers? How do we make it easy uh, to, to give someone the opportunity to succeed, and by the way, therefore to fail? I, I'm not sure you could, you could do it today. And, and I think that's, that's an enormous loss. I, you know, I don't know what organizations are taking up what issue. I, I know that I feel moved to be, and, and, I'm, and I'll drag travelers a little bit, but no one should understand, no one should be confused. It's a, it's, a, it's a company we all work together. We're in the insurance business, that's gonna be our focus. To the extent that I have time and energy and, and health, I wanna be involved in this debate. I want, I want to raise it, I want to raise the discussion. And if someone ultimately says, look, there's a guy who helped raise the, uh, raise the, 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 the quality of discussion, great. A and if not, then I've wasted some time. But, but I feel terrible just sitting idly by and watching the process happen around me. I'm not really good at sitting around and watching processes happen. 